Tonight, the Gold Coast Mayor denies misusing council funds to buy items including handmade luggage and an NRL membership. Queensland scientists try to fast track a cure for the deadly coronavirus as authorities suspect four cases nationwide. Grief and gratitude. Tributes flow for three US firefighters killed battling Australia's blazes. And Ash Barty through to the fourth round of the Australian Open as Serena Williams makes a shock exit. Good evening, Jessica Van Vonderen with ABC News. A scathing corruption investigation into the Gold Coast City Council has exposed claims the mayor misused his powers, including spending public money on luxury luggage and an NRL membership. The Crime and Corruption Commission probe also targets the mayor's chief of staff, alleging he failed to declare conflicts of interests and tried to influence council decisions. Here's state political reporter Alison Horne. I've been asked to uh, comment on uh, Operation Yabba Dabba Do. Operation Yabba was a year-long investigation into the mayor and his Gold Coast Council by the state's corruption watchdog, and the assessment is in. For me, it's an A+. Plus. The Crime and Corruption Commission does not agree. It found the mayor had technically breached policy by using taxpayer money to buy thousands of dollars worth of luxury luggage. His other questionable use of public funds include a membership to the Gold Coast Titans, $500 headphones, watch batteries and selfie sticks, including one for the mayor's daughter. I don't see... A drama. I didn't buy a house next to a bloody under river uh, rail, and uh, it's a selfie stick. You know where you can put that. Even more concerning for the Triple C are actions by Tom Tate's Chief of Staff, Wayne Moran. The corruption body found Mr Moran failed to properly declare conflicts of interest and when the CEO tried to deal with the problem, the Mayor intervened, directing no further action, misusing his powers to protect his Chief of Staff from disciplinary action. The corruption watchdog also found Mr Moran inappropriately interfered in council business. Despite the revelations, the corruption watchdog says actions of the mayor and his chief of staff don't constitute criminal behaviour, but it could amount to misconduct. It's asked the Office of the Independent Assessor to investigate and impose sanctions. Am I upset that's been referred? No. Mr Moran has declined to comment but is on leave with full pay pending investigation. Alison Horn, ABC News. Four people in Australia are being tested for the deadly coronavirus. Health authorities are investigating two possible cases in New South Wales and two in Queensland. 25 people are now known to have died in China from the virus, with a further 830 people infected there. Coronavirus has also spread to other countries, including Taiwan, Singapore, Vietnam and the US, mostly from people travelling from the virus epicentre Wuhan. China has now placed travel restrictions on other cities. Authorities have also closed theatres, cafes and other public spaces, as China correspondent Bill Bertels explained. As the closure of cities in central China came into effect, most residents took it calmly, but not all. There was panic buying in some shops and markets. Social media videos showed hospitals overwhelmed with patients. Flights out of at least three cities have been stopped. Rail services too. Guards deployed to keep people out of stations, now eerily deserted. Wuhan citizens shouldn't leave without a specific reason, and airports, railway stations and other ways out are closed. The World Health Organization has welcomed China's actions so far, but it remains unclear why this virus can be so deadly. We understand the concern um, and we want to get better understanding of what is the cause um, of such mortality. Online, though, anger is growing. Stories are spreading of patients turned away from hospitals in Wuhan, and many here think officials were slow to act. I think the city lockdown is too late. 
In Wuhan, where there are so many cases, they should have acted as soon as the epidemic was confirmed. Away from Wuhan, fear and anxiety has gripped China. Major public events have now been cancelled. Holiday film screenings axed. sold out, And there's a run on masks and hand sanitizer, even in cities far from the epicenter. In most factories across China, they're all doing overtime to meet the demand as everyone travels for the Lunar New Year. It's rare to have a shortage like this. This chemist has had to put a sign on his window saying, we don't have any masks. You feel like a real pariah if you're not wearing one. And if you don't have one, there's nowhere here you can buy one. Tonight is the Chinese equivalent of Christmas Eve. But the usual Lunar New Year cheer is in short supply. China correspondent Bill Bertels joins us from Shanghai. Bill, what's the extent of the impact on Lunar New Year festivities? Yes, it's quite significant. There are a lot of families across China who have cancelled their travel plans, decided that it's not worth taking the risk sitting on a plane or sitting on a fairly crowded train. I know of families up in Beijing, for example, who were planning to spend the Lunar New Year in cities that aren't that close to Wuhan, the epicentre, yet they've decided that the risk isn't worth it. You even have China's government telling airlines and travel companies not to charge additional cancellation fees as a result. So that gives you an idea of how widespread the cancellations are. Uh, we're here on uh, Nanjing Road in Shanghai there are a lot of families out a lot of them are wearing masks um, but you just get the sense that the sort of festive uh, Lunar New Year atmosphere that you would normally have at this time of year is uh, certainly not quite there as much this time around. China correspondent Bill Bertels thank you. Queensland scientists are confident they can develop a vaccine for coronavirus in just 16 weeks. They're among three international teams handpicked to try to fast track a cure. It's a critical race against time, with University of Queensland scientists working around the clock to develop a vaccine for the deadly coronavirus. We're aiming to have something that's ready to go into humans in 16 weeks' time. Possible because they're specialists in a new rapid development technology which allows the fast tracking of DNA-based vaccines rather than having to use live cultures of the deadly virus in laboratories. Our goal is to stay one step ahead and prepare a vaccine on the scale that's needed so we're preparing for a worst-case scenario. It's a big ask and a lot of pressure with infections growing around the world and people dying. At this time, it's, it's the unknowns are what's scary. We don't know how easily transmissible this virus is. The virus is 75% similar to the SARS virus, which killed around 800 people over a decade ago. Now that's made the rapid response more achievable because the scientists here already know the genome sequence. We are mimicking the virus. We start from the genetic code of the virus and use that to produce protein in cell culture. The aim is for the protein to engage the body's immune defences and fight off the virus. The team is one of three international partners tasked overnight by the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation to urgently find a cure. We're aiming to produce an injectable dose, so pre-filled syringes that can be um, sent around the world. Authorities say 47,000 Chinese travel to Australia every week. So the numbers are significant and we know that they'll increase with the Chinese New Year travel. But people are being urged not to panic. If one or more are eventually found to be positive, they'll be quarantined and, and looked after. But people are still taking precautions with a run on safety masks making stocks scarce. Lexi Hamilton-Smith, ABC News. Nationals leader Michael McCormack has strongly defended his deputy, Bridget McKenzie, who's under pressure to resign. Despite the public show of support, there are growing doubts within government as to whether Senator McKenzie can survive. Here's political reporter Jane Norman. His deputy's in deep danger, but Michael McCormack's digging in. fact is, uh, Bridget McKenzie... Uh, has done an outstanding job as the sports minister and in her subsequent role uh, of agriculture. Her fate rests in the hands of the country's top public servant, who's examining whether she's breached ministerial standards. Bridget McKenzie's confident she hasn't. Yeah. Oh! Does Bridget McKenzie still have your support? She does. 
and she's got some high-profile backers. Is she going to resign herself? I mean, no, she she's, no, she's not, Carl. So, so she, she, she's going to stay where she is. I, I think if you strip away the emotion from this debate and look at the facts, which is what we should do, uh, I don't see the case has been made for Bridget McKenzie's removal. That's despite a damning report finding clear political bias in the way she doled out a hundred million dollars worth of grants to sporting clubs across the country. Then there's her own admission that she was a member of a club she funded and never declared it. But even that's now being contested. Bridget McKenzie has uh, declared uh, her memberships as she was required to do. If history is anything to go by, her days on the front bench could be numbered. Liberals Jamie Briggs, Stuart Robert and Susan Lee were all referred to the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet as ministers. None of them survived. There is a view within government that it's a matter of when, not if, Bridget McKenzie goes. But it's complicated. Removing her from the ministry would require the approval of the Nationals' leader, Michael McCormack, and publicly, at least, he's offering her his full support. Then there's the potential knock-on effect of instability for Mr McCormack himself, already the subject of murmurings among his colleagues. It's just media speculation. Bridget McKenzie's going to stay there because she's being protected by the National Party. I mean, in this government, everyone's protected by someone. Until they become too much of a problem for the Prime Minister. Jane Norman, ABC News, Canberra. Parts of northwest Queensland are on flood watch, with heavy rain forecast to fall in the coming days. Already, some drought stricken areas have received more than 100 welcome millimetres. Hilary Castle filed this story from Longreach. Huge black clouds brought storms to towns that haven't seen decent rain in almost a year. So far it's the Gulf Country experiencing some of the biggest falls. Up here our wet season is meant to run from November through to April and um, yeah, we're nearly at the end of January and this is the first proper rain, so we're pretty stoked. West of Bundaberg, Angus Logan captured Popgun Creek, meeting him at the farm gate. A rare sight in an outback town, Longreach received a drenching. About 8 o'clock, it really started raining, like torrential rain, and then we had 60 mils in under two hours. So that was like a miracle. It's been a long time. Um, yeah, I think nine, ten years is sort of what they're, most places have, have had to experience of drought now, so this will be something really special. And the locals can't contain their excitement. It's exhilarating. It's just wonderful. they running around the yard all morning making sure that all the, all the uh, dripper systems are turned off. While last night's rain isn't drought breaking, many are hoping it could be the start of the first normal wet season in the region in over a decade. And Queensland needs the rain. Most of the state is officially drought declared. The radar shows many of these storms are falling in the right places with the promise of more to come. In some parts there is the potential for some really significant rainfall, more than a, a month's rainfall over a period of a week. But look, we're not expecting a drought breaking rainfall at this stage. It's a good start. Hilary Castle, ABC News, Longreach. Three Americans killed while fighting fires in an air tanker crash in New South Wales have been identified. Police had to undergo the grim task of removing the dead from the wreckage as investigators begin the huge job of working out what went wrong. A charred reminder of a dark day, a kilometre long scar littered with pieces of the wreckage. The C-130 air tanker had just released a line of fire retardant before it plummeted to the ground. Fuck off, message red. Put your gap and message red. Fuck. It crashed, huh? Yeah, fire comes. It's just uh, of all the flames. Over. Flight engineer Rick DeMorgan Jr., First Officer Paul Hudson and Captain Ian Macbeth were highly respected and qualified. Their American colleagues left devastated. It hits hard when we lose one of our own, and uh, so it's been a, an evening and a, a day of, of mourning. We will be forever indebted uh, to the enormous contribution uh, and indeed the ultimate sacrifice that's been, that's been paid as a result of these extraordinary individuals. Police today had the grim task of removing the dead from the wreckage. Are, are you able to describe, describe the wreckage? There's not much intact at all. Crash site investigators will speak to witnesses and they'll try to find the cockpit voice recorder of the crew's final moments. 
Despite an easing in conditions today, there are still thick plumes of smoke over this massive fire burning in the snowy mountains. And it's thick smoke some experts believe could have caused the pilot to become disoriented and lose control. I know it's very frustrating and people, people want immediate answers, but uh, uh, you know we're in the forensic phase of the examination. And still they come. More American firefighters today flying in to save Australian homes. Tom Maddox, ABC News, Numerella. A body has been found inside a house destroyed in yesterday's fires on the New South Wales south coast. Police discovered the remains at a home southwest of Maruya, an area where a number of properties were hit. The death toll from the bushfires in New South Wales this season now stands at 25. Meanwhile, six firefighters escaped serious injury when their truck rolled late last night. We just kind of approached the, the barrier and went kind of straight through it and then things just went black and started rolling around, just like being on a washing machine. The group was taken to hospital and treated for non-life-threatening injuries. Still to come on ABC News, Flying Fox Flight Path, how North Queensland bats are disrupting medical emergencies. And one club player, Alex Glenn, set to lead the Broncos into a new decade. You might not have heard of it, but Gumby Gumby is a plant that's long been used in traditional bush medicine. It's also at the centre of a trademark dispute. Gungaloo elder Steve Kemp learned how to use the Gumby Gumby tree in traditional mm. medicine when he was a boy. Uncle Charlie would boil up the Gumby Gumby, you'd drink it and um, boil the leaf up, drink it like tea, and that would cure your cold. In his language, the name means woman woman and was used to describe the Petosporum angustifolium plant. But a central Queensland business says it invented the name and applied to trademark it three years ago. Applicant Cartier Ada Amato, who owns retailer Gumby Gumby Yapoon, says there is no evidence that the Gumby Gumby name is associated with the plant or with any of the 250 Indigenous languages. But the application brought has now formally expired. Government agency Intellectual Property Australia says the name is commonly used and the applicants failed to address objections made against the case. Palawa woman and Gumby Gumby retailer Lee Doherty says it's a great outcome. It's certainly a, a win for my business because that means that I'm able to keep trading using the name Gumby Gumby for the bush foods that uh, I particularly harvest, but also a big win for Indigenous people here in Australia. Legal experts say the case highlights issues surrounding Indigenous intellectual property. It raises questions about the sufficiency and adequacy of a number of different fields of intellectual property in Australia. For now, Steve Kemp is pleased the traditional name is not being exploited. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> you know, because they shouldn't have done it. Jemima Burt, ABC News, Rockhampton. North Queensland residents are demanding action after thousands of flying foxes prevented an emergency helicopter from landing. The Health Minister says the ongoing bat issue is not compromising outcomes, but those living in Ingham aren't convinced. Residents watched on as bats swarmed a medical helicopter in Ingham. Here's the chopper, the second pass is had to try and get to the hospital. After several attempts to land at the hospital, the chopper was forced to go elsewhere and locals aren't impressed. Not having a chopper that can land in those emergencies could be the difference between life and death for some poor family. It's not the first time the bat population has stopped patients getting to the hospital. We have thousands and thousands of bats blocking the night sky every evening. But the health minister says the bats are not affecting the delivery of health care. The advice I get from our aeromedical uh, specialists is that uh, they are uh, used to and accustomed to and have protocols to deal with uh, all sorts of incidents that might affect their ability to land. The flying fox population is also causing havoc at the Ingham State School and parents want to protect their children. They're very worried, uh, concerned about the safety of their students being in the school grounds. Trees are being cut down to prevent further roosting. The Hinchinbrook Council says it's doing what it can to manage the problem. The animals are, are refusing to cooperate. There's simply no room in the roost. 
Um, so the, we're just really struggling. The Environment Department says the increased bat activity is the result of a natural migration pattern that fluctuates year on year. But residents here in Ingham say the situation is getting worse and are demanding action. It's an absolute disgrace and we need the Queensland Government to step in. The bats are expected to hang around for another few months. Chloe Shamiki, ABC News, Ingham. To finance, Australian share prices moved a bit higher today. Here's Alan Kohler. Well, the dollar is back at 68.4 US cents, which is where it was yesterday morning. So the response to the better than expected employment data yesterday was little more than a twitch. The pricing for a February rate cut is still down around 20%. What happened last night was that the US dollar went up a bit. And just as a follow-up to the unemployment rate, which has improved from 5.2 to 5.1 per cent, here's a chart of jobless rates in Australia, the US, UK and New Zealand. Just eight years ago, we were the lowest at 5 per cent. Now we're the highest at 5 per cent, while the others are clustered around about four now. Financial markets are dominated at the minute by chatter about the Wuhan coronavirus and a lot of charts are flying about comparing the current situation with SARS in 2003. And most of them show a small decline around April that year in Asian GDP and share market indexes, followed by quick recoveries. But I thought this is the one that was most relevant to Australia. There was a sharp drop in tourist arrivals in 2003, which took a few months to recover from and which will likely be exacerbated this year by the bushfires. Global share markets were subdued today and the local market was also subdued. Among the best performers was CSL, which possesses a flu vaccine, although there's no suggestion yet that it works on the Wuhan virus. CSL is just on an absolute tear at the moment, up more than 13 per cent since January the 1st. Also, IAG was sold down because of the hailstones the other day. There was a pretty big fall in the iron ore price today, while base metals and oil also fell. Gold and coal went up. And that's finance. In tennis, seven-time champion Serena Williams has been knocked out of the Australian Open. China's Wang Qiong put in a stirring performance to overcome Williams in a high-quality third-round match, while world number one Ash Barty won in straight sets. Serena Williams dropped just one game in her last match against Won Tsiong, but faced surprising resistance early. The American was caught off guard as Wong showed impressive speed around the court and aggression. And look at the stare down from Won Tsiong. The Chinese star held strong to win the first 6-4. Has she ever played a better set? Wong broke again in the fifth game of the second and served for the match when Serena started her comeback. That's unbelievable. A passionate Williams broke back and took the set in a tiebreaker. The seven-time Australian Open champion charged in the final set, but Wong wouldn't take a backward step. Leading 6-5 in the decider, she made the breakthrough. An early start to tomorrow's Chinese New Year celebrations, but not for all. Are you going to allow yourself a little celebration tonight? No. <laughs> Ash Barty's third round opponent, Elena oh. Ribikina, started with a barrage of winners. Barty used more craft than power. Brilliant. And made the decisive break as Ribikina's errors started to mount. Oh, and she takes yeah. it. The world number one took the first set, 6-3. Ruba Kina had lost just one of her ten matches in 2020 before today, but was dismantled by Barty. She took just 78 minutes to complete the job. And she's done it. The world number one through to the last 16. Men's favourite Novak Djokovic progressed with ease, while 2017 champion Caroline Wozniacki bowed out, marking an emotional end to her career. Peter Lusted, ABC News, Melbourne. In Big Bash cricket, the Sydney Sixers have moved back into second spot with an eight-wicket win over the Brisbane Heat at the Gabba. Half-centuries to openers Josh Felipe and James Vince helped the Sixers chase down the 127-run victory target with 25 balls to spare. Felipe scored an unbeaten 52, while Vince made 51. Oh, it's gone. That has been smoked by James Vince. The timing again. He is motoring along. Steve Smith was dismissed for nine in his first BBL match in six years.
In rugby league, Alex Glenn was close to tears as he was named the new captain of the Brisbane Broncos. The one club player now wants to deliver Brisbane its first premiership in 13 years. Michael Rennie reports. The new Broncos captain wears his heart on his sleeve. It's not hard to get emotional in a moment like this. Alex Glenn has spent 12 years playing rugby league for the one club. Today he reached the pinnacle of his career. I didn't sink in for a bit till I got home and I was sitting on the couch with Gemma and I just grabbed her and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to be the captain. When he called me and told me, he was just like, I can't believe it. I, I actually can't believe it. I'm so, I'm, I'm like, well, what did you say? And he's like, I just shook. I said to him, I'm shaking. Broncos coach Anthony Seabold broke the news to Glenn two weeks ago. Yeah, I took him for lunch over the police club, actually. <laughs> Had a little date. <laughs> oh, I don't want him to change at all. Lex Lexi doesn't need to be calling our players on the footy field. He doesn't need to be you know, coming up with the different types of strategies. The 31-year-old replaces Darius Boyd, whose form was under constant scrutiny last season. But ultimately, I just wanted to take some pressure and, and some of the spotlight off Darius and allow him to enjoy his rugby league at the end of his career. Brisbane was thrashed 58-0 in week one of the playoffs, the biggest loss in NRL finals history. We use that as motivation uh, to make sure that that never happens again. Failure is a, a great uh, stepping, stepping stone to, to success. The ultimate accomplishment would be winning the club's first premiership in 13 years. And my goal was always to bring that trophy back where it belongs. Are you proud of Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> but for now, Alex Glenn, Dude, look, he's got ice cream, can focus on more important things. Michael Rennie, ABC News. In basketball, Brisbane local Will Magne could be NBA bound after another stellar performance for the Bullets. The 21 year old led the fight back for Brisbane against the South East Melbourne Phoenix after the home side trailed for most of the contest. Magne finished with 19 points and six rebounds. But it was his seven blocks, including three in a row against Phoenix star Mitch Creek, that had the crowd on its feet. I told you! The win is the Bullets' fourth in a row. Weather now with Ashley Stevenson. Good evening, Jess. All eyes are on a monsoonal flow up in the tropics that is due to bring some heavy rain to northwest Queensland over the coming days. We could see some fantastic widespread totals in the region, although a flood watch is current for areas including Mount Isa and Cloncurry, so please keep an eye on the warnings. With that, moisture being drawn down. We've seen some showers and storms today across northern and central parts. This afternoon, storms fired up, bringing some isolated falls of up to 88 millimetres near Gladstone. Temperatures were thankfully closer to average today, although still a very humid night. It dropped to just 27 in Gladstone before topping 29, 36 in Rockhampton and 34 in Townsville. Air conditioners have been getting a good workout in Brisbane. We had another very uncomfortable night with the apparent temperature not dropping below 31 degrees. Warm in the west to 35 for Ipswich. Zooming out, you can see the slow-moving tropical low over the Northern Territory. Humid winds are feeding into that system, triggering thunderstorms and rain, which will continue for the next few days. On the chart, further showers and storms are active near this trough line down into New South Wales. So we could see the odd light shower for Sydney at 27. Mostly sunny in Melbourne at 25. Just the odd cloud in Hobart and 24. Sunny and warm in Perth at 34. Home to Queensland, we're likely to see showers and storms over much of the state, but the focus will really be on the north. Some locally heavy falls are possible, particularly about the northwest and around Mount Isa. Looking at the four day rain forecast, the northwest could get widespread totals of up to 200 millimetres, but there could be locally heavy falls of three to 400 millimetres. To forecast and in the north, as we've heard, rain and storms are very likely relatively cool for Mount Isa at 31, a top of 32 in Cairns. More of the same for inland parts, although the far southwest looks like it will miss out on the rain. Birdsville and Thargaminda both heading for 40 degrees. In the southeast, showers all round. There could be up to 30 millimetres forecast for Dolby, a top of 31 degrees for the Sunshine Coast. 
A few showers for Brisbane tomorrow and a top of 31, 32 in Ipswich. On Moreton Bay, winds northerly up to 20 knots, seas about one metre, sunrise at 5.14. And looking ahead, rain is clearing early next week, heading for a top of 32 in Brisbane on Tuesday, 34 in Ipswich, 32 again on Wednesday and 34 then in Ipswich. Jeff. Thanks, Ash, and that is ABC News for now. Thank you for watching. I'll be back tomorrow night. Until then, from all the team, enjoy your evening.